Well, good morning and welcome to the church at Avenue South, especially if you're a first-time guest. We're so grateful that you're here with us on Palm Sunday, which is the first Sunday or the first day in Holy Week, which is an incredibly significant week in the life of followers of Jesus. And so thank you for being here. You honor us with your presence. So let us know how we can honor you by helping support you. We're down front after services or at the welcome desk. And what, a, what an incredible um, gift. Uh, gosh, I'm spoiled. I sit up here every Sunday morning, and I get to hear from Nick Gonzalez and the worship team as they lead us. And so uh, we've sung together, and he led us in prayer. Uh, we will give together before we conclude today. There's several things we do that are biblically based when we gather on Sunday mornings. But over the next couple of minutes, we're going to read God's Word together. That's one of the ways we worship. And if you have a copy of the Bible, I want to encourage you to join me in the book of Joshua. We're going to be in the book of Joshua. And the reason I would always encourage you to, to join me there is... Um, I, I will always tell you the truth and what's in God's Word, but, but I want you to see it for yourself. And if we spend an hour on Sunday mornings together, there's 167 other hours in your week where if this is real and it's true and it's helpful, that, that's where it's going to play out. So we want you to have your own copy and to kind of feast on it after this morning. And speaking of Joshua, um, some of you know that Joshua followed Moses. We finished our Bible reading plan. We're going through the whole church and the whole word for the whole year. And last week we finished by seeing Moses uh, dies and passes away. And so that's how Deuteronomy concludes. And so now Joshua, the book of Joshua, is named after the guy who followed Moses. Now look, even if you're not a follower of God yet, you may be familiar with the name and kind of the fame biblically of Moses. I bet if we did an unscientific poll, we'd find less people that know who Joshua is or what he did. And that's kind of because he's the guy who followed the guy. And you really don't want to be the guy who follows the guy. You want to be like the guy who follows the guy who followed the guy. Like you kind of want your own start. Like that, that's pretty big shoes to fill, right? Uh, I don't know who in here has got a task in front of them that's pretty daunting. Maybe this afternoon, like you, you, you're, uh, you're physically here, but mentally and emotionally, you're not here because you're thinking about everything you got in front of you. Or, or it may be like something exciting and encouraging, like God calls Joshua, come lead my people. That's a good thing, right? Maybe you got good stuff in front of you, but you're overwhelmed by it. You don't even know where to start. I'm so glad you, you didn't sleep in. I, I, I thank you for getting dressed and coming on into the house of God, because I think God's got an incredibly hopeful and encouraging word for any of us who've ever felt overwhelmed or we've got big shoes to fill, or we don't even know how to address what's in front of us. I don't want you to just take my word for it. I want you to see where that's true in Scripture. So let me invite you to stand in honor of God's Word. And we're going to read from Joshua chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 1 through 9 together. And we'll put this on the screen for you as well. It says, After the death of Moses, who was the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now you... And all of the people, that's all the Israelites, prepare to cross over the Jordan to the land that I'm giving to the Israelites. I've given you every place where the sole of your foot treads, just as I promised Moses. Your territory will be from the wilderness and Lebanon to the great river, the Euphrates River, and all the land of the Hittites and west to the Mediterranean Sea. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. I will be with you just as I was with Moses. I will not leave you or abandon you. Be strong and courageous, for you will distribute the land I swore to their fathers to give them as an inheritance. And above all, be strong and courageous to observe carefully the whole instruction that my servant Moses commanded to you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you will have success whenever you go. This book of instruction must not depart from your mouth. You're to meditate on it day and night so that you may carefully observe everything written in it. For then you will prosper and succeed in whatever you do. Haven't I commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. 
I will say the word of the Lord if you would say thanks be to God. The word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father God, this room is full of people that have a lot of exciting and encouraging things in front of us. But some of those, even though they're hopeful and encouraging, they, they overwhelm us. And it can be frightening. Even good things can be a little bit scary if we're not sure how to handle them. And Lord, there's some of us in the room that, uh, gosh, we need a word of courage and confidence. Because we just don't have it. And we're overwhelmed. So for everyone in the room, from the youngest to the oldest, God, we just pray that you would speak by the power of your Spirit in a way that while we read these words, they may have been given from you to Joshua and your people thousands of years ago. May we hear your voice in the stillness of our heart and know that your voice that spoke then is authoritative, speaking to us now through this text. Lord, bless this room and those that have ears to hear the words, be strong and courageous. Not because of our strength and our abilities, but because you, our God, are with us. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. We'll go ahead and be seated for the next few moments. If you are visiting with us, I do think it might be helpful to keep your Bible open so that you can kind of chew on this text a little bit as we walk through it together. I mentioned to you that Moses, who has passed away, is kind of handing the baton to Joshua. And Moses, in verse 1, is referred to as God's servant. That's how he's referred to. Moses did a lot of incredibly wonderful and bold things as a leader, but he's remembered by God to the next generation and the next leader as a servant. And God tells Joshua, just as I led and supported and encouraged and equipped Moses, I'll do the same thing for you. Now's your turn. And so for me, we're not even a verse in, and here's what I think. God works in and through his people, and then he buries his workers, and the mission continues through others. Like, this is not a story, nor is the the Pentateuch, which is what we call the Torah, the the, the first five books of the Bible we just finished last week, um, which is all wrought with the, the works of Moses. Like, it's not a story about Moses. This is not even the book of Joshua. Hang with me here. Don't laugh at me. This is not a story about Joshua. This is a story about the God of Moses and Joshua. And even when we read, I I think there's a lot everybody in the room can learn from Joshua. So if you are facing something daunting, you may want to dust for God's fingerprints and be like, well, how could he kind of be working in my life in similar fashion? I think that's helpful. I think you should look for ways that God's speaking to you through another brother or sister's story. That's why we read. We, We see Joshua. We see Moses. We see Deborah. We see Ruth. We see these godly leaders who are imperfect and flawed, but God worked in their lives. He might be working that way in ours. But even whatever we benefit from it, it's not even a story about you or me or us. This is a story about God. He's the main character. And so the stability that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever is what he offered Moses, what he offered Joshua, and now what he offers you with whatever you've got in front of you. I was faithful to that servant. I'll be faithful to you, And I'll be faithful to those who come after you. And we just find ourselves in a long line of followers of God after Moses and Joshua and so many others. The same promise is here for us. And one of the things it says here is that Moses was the leader at the time where Joshua was his assistant. Joshua was his assistant. And so the calling here that God's going to put on Joshua's life is, Moses died in the wilderness. He did not get to go into the promised land. And now he says to Joshua, you're going to lead two million plus Israelites into the promised land. And I'll be with you. I don't know if you saw that, but three times in nine verses it says, I'll be with you. I'll be with you. I'll be with you. Like, I'll take you in, and and I'm already there ahead of you before you get there. But here's one of the realities of this text. He's giving Joshua confidence that you've followed and watched Moses as he's followed me. So I'll be the one to empower you, but you also have really good experience from another God follower who discipled you. And that's the calling for all of us in this room. 
and all of us that are part of the church, we want to be disciples who then go and make disciples. It's almost as if in Moses' life, like Moses is following God. If God's over here, he's, he's moving toward God. He's moving towards faithfulness and obedience. And, and Joshua's just walking in his footsteps. And he's kind of like, Joshua, follow me as I follow God. And literally what rabbis would do is as they would walk, like in New Testament, you know, like in Jesus' day and age, like rabbis would walk and they'd kick up dust. The crowd around them would kick up dust. And they would talk about walking in the dust of the rabbi. Come follow me while I follow God, and let's do this together, because the day's coming where you're going to be on your own. And isn't that what Jesus did? For his 36-month or so public ministry, he, um, he, he did miracles. He modeled things, and, and then he would say, um, watch me do it. Now join me in this. So Jesus was the one who multiplied that little sack lunch of five loaves and two fishes. That's all God. But then he said, come do this with me. Go, go get the meal, uh, bring it in, I'll multiply it, go collect the leftovers. But there was a point coming where Jesus is like, I, I won't be with you much longer. Watch me, let's do it together, and, and now you go and do it. And that's where Joshua is. So it's okay to be overwhelmed, it's okay to kind of be a little, you know, just to have a little trepidation about what's in front of you. But if you've submitted yourself as a disciple to other disciples, like in the local church, you got people that have been modeling it for you. And that's why that's so important. Everybody in this room ought to have Joshua's in their life, right? Everybody in this room ought to have Joshua's. Um, I I look around this room. From the teenagers on the front row, there, there are children in this room. On the second row, like all the way to the back, I see some in here. So that would be parents. You got Joshua's living under your roof. And you get to model every day, start stacking days and weeks and years to show them what following God looks like, even when it's daunting, even when it's overwhelming. If you're a college student, we got a lot of college students in here right now. Listen, at your campus, whether it's Lipscomb or Belmont or Treveca or Vanderbilt or wherever it may be, Columbia State, like there are people around you that the Lord will bring into your sphere of influence that you can teach them what it means to follow God. And the best way to do that is you just be a follower first. Don't overthink it and let them see what it looks like to follow. Because did you see what he said here? In verse 3, look with me. He said, I've given you every place where the sole of your foot treads. So in other words, like in Genesis 15, nearly 500 years before this text, God said, I'm going to give you the land of Canaan. I've I've already acquired it for you. You'll have to go in and fight some battles. I'm not going to wipe everybody out. Like you'll you'll have some obstacles. But I'll be with you in that. But But I've given you the land under your feet. So maybe you've never been to Israel. And maybe you'll never go to this land we're reading about right here on this side of heaven. But here's what I'll tell you. Everybody in this room's got land under your feet. Everybody in this room's got land under your feet. And I'm talking spiritually. What is the land under your feet that God's given you? What's the land under your feet that God's given you? If you're a doctor or a physician, that's the land under your feet. How can you find creative ways to appropriately bring hope and salt and light into those places, right? Got a lot of educators in the room, teachers, faculty, like doing heroic work in here, right? We have counselors and therapists in this room right now, like doing wonderful, awesome things. Like that's the land under your feet. So when we read stories like this, it's like, all right, it's not exactly apples to apples. It's, we're not going into Canaan, but like tomorrow morning you'll get up and you'll go into the land under your feet. And what is God asking you to do there? Because this is a commissioning for Joshua, right? He's putting a calling on his life. And, you know, if if you went into a certain career because you felt God called you, we use that phrase a lot, like, I feel God shaped me and invited me into this future with him. Um, I'm a pastor because, like, I discerned God was asking me to to step into this calling, right? Like, we all have a story of how God called us. You talk to our global workers that are on the mission field, they'll tell you when they started connecting the dots that God was calling them and commissioning them with this work. That's what's happening for Joshua. So what is it that God's calling you to do? Chances are really good there's going to be obstacles. For them, they literally, and I I really didn't play this up or really draw much attention to this when we talked about some of the challenges of going in the promised land, they literally were going to be facing giants. So they're literally going going to be facing people that are big and tall and strong with fortified cities. And so God, God knew that, that Joshua would have those moments where he'd say, like, I want to be faithful with the land under my feet. And maybe you're like, I want to be faithful with the land under my feet. It ain't going to be easy. Uh, and God knows that. So what did he say in verse 6? He says in verse 6, be strong and courageous. 
be strong, courage. He knew he needed a word of courage and a word of strength. I, I see you. I feel you. Like, I got it. And I want you to know, I see what you're kind of processing. You've got this. Now, who in this room needs that word from the Lord this morning? I think we've seen globally recently somebody who needed strength and courage to, to face what they were facing. In 2010, Amy and I, uh, we, we went to visit my uncle who lived in Surrey, England, which is right outside of London. And so I, I never really followed the royal family much before that. So I don't read a lot about it, don't study a lot about it, but, but I started paying attention to some of that history since then, right? A couple months ago, if you have been living under a rock, um, here's what I want to tell you. Princess Kate, the Princess of Wales, um, nobody's seen her really in public for a couple of months. And there was an image posted of her, I think around January, where like it, it looked like it maybe been doctored. And so the media, like it's a whole vibe. It's a whole industry that just follows the royal family, right? And dissects everything. Started like, like chirping. We hadn't seen her. Like her, her wrist looks blurred in the photo. This angle of her arm doesn't look right. It looks like copy and paste it. Like what's going on? What's going on? We haven't seen her. We haven't heard her. Nobody's seen her in public. And almost like this hounding of like, we need info. We need info. We need info. Uh, to the extent that like within the last couple of days, forget when it is, she posted a video. Have y'all seen this? Not nudge your heads. You seen this? She announces uh, that in January she had abdominal surgery. Now, here's, here's what I want to tell you. Like, how many of you would like to say, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm having something going on in my abdomen. I just want to post a video about it. It's probably not what you would do first thing tomorrow morning. Okay, that's a very private thing. And she says, um, and, and things looked good. The margins looked good until they didn't. And it's cancer. And so I'm dealing with cancer. And I thought when I heard her story, um, I, I've lost an uncle to lung cancer who never smoked. And my mom is a cancer survivor, and I went with her to her appointment when they were like, you need, I, we were eating at Maggiano's. Do you remember when she got the call from the doctor about 7 p.m., stepped outside, and she started crying? So that next couple of days, we go in, and we sit there, and a buddy of mine said, take a notepad, because if he says cancer, she won't hear anything else. I was in the room with her, and I thought, how life-changing, how traumatic. And it was very private and personal, right? And those of you that have walked this road, I, I, I would assume very traumatic, very personal, very private. And yet she was pressed so hard and dissected every nuance of her life that she felt she needed to come out and say, here's what's going on. And part of her, her answer was, I've got young children. I'm trying to appropriately disclose to my children in ways they can understand that their mom has cancer. But I'm going public so everyone will know. Like, I, here's the deal. Uh, whether you track with the royal family, make of it what you will, I think that's a moment of great bravery and courage to say, here's what I'm dealing with. It's personal, it's private, it's traumatic, but just to everybody back off here. And there's probably people in this room dealing with something similar. Everybody in this room is dealing with something. We, you know what's crazy is we just often don't know the extent to what everybody's struggling with. Um, in this congregation in the last three months, We've had two people involved in major transplant surgeries. One member received a kidney, and one young adult gave a kidney to her mom in this room. I, know, I mean, not the surgery. The surgery didn't happen in this room. Like, that's in this congregation. I said that, and I was like, I need to, I need to clear that up. That would be fantastic. Um, that's, that's pretty serious stuff. That requires bravery and courage. I could keep going. If, if you're in college and you start dating, you question whether or not to sleep with the person you're dating to see if we're a good match. That, that's, that's a real thing. I have a really good friend who follows the Lord. She doesn't even live in our state. Not even part of our church. And her boyfriend kept asking her to sleep with her, and she was like, I just don't want to compromise on that. I need courage in that. And so she broke up with him. I won't compromise that. I'm going to honor God with my body. And by the way, ladies, when the right guy comes along, he won't ask you to sleep with him to see if you're compatible. That's almost like, because if we get married and we're not, are you out? Or did you marry me for sex? So like, there, there's a lot of big stuff in front of us in the room, right? Is that fair? And we need courage and we need strength. So that's legit. And in verse 9, when he says... 
don't be afraid. This is not God saying, act like it doesn't bother you. He's not immune to the emotions that he gave us. We're a whole person, and he gave you a mind, body, soul, spirit, emotions. He's saying, like, don't, don't give in to those things. Don't let them own you and dictate. Don't let them rent space in your head. That's why we pray Ephesians 6, the helmet of salvation to protect us. He says, be strong and courageous, not because of how awesome you are, Joshua, not because of how talented and gifted you are, but I'll be with you. That's what he says in verse 5. Nobody's going to be able to stand against you, not because of who you are, but because I will be with you just like I was with Moses. I'm good like that. That's where our strength comes from. God is with us. You can't, but he can. And that's the name Emmanuel, God with us. Like God taking up flesh, 100% God, 100% flesh. So like God never sinned. Jesus never sinned, but he knows what it's like to have a hard day. He knows what it's like to face daunting things. When he tells, when God tells Joshua, be strong and courageous, I couldn't help but think about Palm Sunday. I got a palm branch up here, and if you got kiddos, um, and, and they're in the grove right now, they are currently being armed with these palm branches. <laughs> and I say that, I, I did a little unscientific research. No little girl used this as a weapon in the hallway this morning. Every little boy, two brothers, my sons used to years ago, I mean, just walloping each other with these palm branches. And the reason we hand these out is because this is the beginning of Holy Week. It is the first day of the last week of Jesus' life. I told you he lived in the Galilee. He'd go down to Jerusalem for the Passover. Like the last week of his life, he's going for the Passover. And you remember what the Passover festival is? It is a commemoration where you go and you get an innocent, spotless lamb, and, and you, you, you allow that lamb to take on the sin of the individual and the family, and then you slaughter that lamb at sundown, on Friday of that week so that that lamb dies for your sin so the family doesn't have to. Like, that's how God liberated his people in Egypt. He says, every generation, every year, you need to have this, this remembrance. And so um, Jesus is coming into Jerusalem on the fold of a donkey, a colt, and people like, they needed a Savior as much as you and I do. And they knew they were jacked up. They knew they had problems. They knew they had issues. And they knew even if everything they wanted in life came to fruition, what if you get everything you're after? Then what? Because your flesh only knows one word, and it's more. And they were designed to be fully content in God. So they wanted a Savior. So they ripped off these palm branches, hoping Jesus is that Savior. And they waved these and put them on the ground and threw their coats down so that like, even the feet of the donkey walk on those things so it doesn't touch the dirt. That's the way, like, we don't even want the donkey this potential Savior's on to hit that dirt. And they yelled, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means, oh, save us. And within a matter of days, Jesus would be betrayed by a close disciple. He would be trumped up on charges. They didn't even try people legally at night. It was against the law. But they tried Jesus at night. Huh. And, and then they not only arrest him and try him, but then they crucify him. And, and he, he gave up the ghost. He said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit at about 3 o'clock on Friday afternoon. When, when the sun is starting to get towards dusk, when everybody in all of Jerusalem would be slaughtering the unblemished lamb to take on the sin of the family. That's when he died. How fascinating is that? The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus knew every bit of that was coming. That's why he was born. You ever wonder, what's my purpose? What am I here for? You do have a purpose. His was to atone for, to absorb the sins of you and me so that we could be forgiven and be offered a right relationship with God so we could flourish as he originally intended in the garden. you got to believe Jesus it took boldness and courage and strength to ride in on that donkey on Palm Sunday. That's why I prayed, Father, if there's any way this cup can pass, that's my prayer. But at the end of the day, not my will, but yours. Because his dad had said, there's no other way, son. Like, they can't save themselves. Like, they need a perfect Savior to atone for them. And so the father asked the son, obey my commands. Does that not remind you of Joshua as well? All God's asking Joshua to do is like, hey, man, you don't have to be some, like, awesome leader. Don't try to be different and unique. Like, I'm going to be different than Moses. This is how we're going to do it. He's like, just obey my word. Did you see that? Be strong and courageous, verse 7, to obey the whole instruction. That means the whole full counsel of the Bible. It's trustworthy. 
Don't compromise my word. Trust my word. What did Jesus do? Yes, Father, I will obey. Jesus is the newer and better Joshua in every possible way, right? So whatever you got facing you, recovery from kidney transplant surgery, cancer diagnosis, you're in remission and it grips you that it may come back. Worrying about those dating relationships, that's legitimate. Is this the guy? Is this not the guy? God, when will this guy come along? When will she come along? Whatever you've got in front of you, God says, be strong and courageous because God is with you and it's in and only through Christ that you can face whatever's in front of you. It's in him and only through him. And so that's what God's asking Joshua to do. Just be faithful with, with the land under your feet. You can't. But I can, because I'm with you. And the greatest example that I'm with you is my son, Jesus Christ. I've got this, if you'll just simply follow what I ask you to do. So whatever you're facing, you're not alone. You're not helpless. You have every resource you could possibly need. And for some of us, that may be the hardest part. Like, we don't like that it's out of our control. I want it to play out a certain way, and I can't dictate that. But you know what? It is impossible to please God without faith. We're not religious people. We're people of faith. And God says, trust me, because I've got this. And, and if you're curious and you're like, I just need a little encouragement, look at the people that came before you, Moses, others, hundreds of years. Like, look at the people that will come after you. Like, and for us, we're on this side of this story by thousands of years. He is faithful to his word and his promises and to his people, even when we're undeserving. He just simply says, be strong and courageous by holding on to my strength and being present with me. And he knew it's going to be hard to believe. And that's why three times in nine verses, he says, be strong and courageous, I'm with you. Because it's like, be strong and courageous. Got it, what's next? Be strong and courageous. Okay, yep, cool. Um, what's next? Be strong and courageous. You know why you can do that? Because I'm with you. And Christ in and through you. I mean, isn't that what we'll celebrate next week on Easter? That Jesus not only died for us, we need a cross-centered theology. We need to feel the weight of our sin and that it drove Jesus to the cross. It wasn't just the Jews or the Romans 2,000 years ago that put him on that cross. We did. We have to have a cross-centered theology, but that isn't the end of the story. We don't just have a crucified Savior. We have a risen, resurrected Savior. Like, God raises dead things. That's what he does. So that's next Sunday. So I don't want to preach Easter sermon. I'm getting worked up, Amy. Like, I don't want, I don't want to preach. I got that one on the back eye simmering already. But, like, we, I, don't, I don't want to preach that sermon yet. But that means victory over the power of sin to dictate and own you. You're, you're not without help in whatever's going on. Victory over sin, victory over death, victory over the gates of hell. They won't stand against you, Christ alive in you. Like, be strong and courageous because my son is with you. Be strong and courageous because I'm with you. Be strong and courageous because Jesus has already done this on your behalf. You hold on to him and you'll be fine in the future. I'm going to ask Dave Burns to come up here to the piano. Uh, the worship team, the whole worship team is not going to come up here yet. But Dave's going to come up here, and he's just going to start softly playing. Because here's what I think we need to do. I think we need to be strong and courageous in this moment. And for those of you that have been here any number of years, you, you know that, like, I believe that if you don't make decisions, if you don't take actions, if you don't drive a stake in the ground, you, you might leave what God stirs up through song or through sermon or whatever, just right here in this room until next Sunday. I want to challenge you to be strong and courageous. And one of the ways we're going to do that together, to lock arms and say, we're in this together, we're going to be strong and courageous together, is we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper together. So there's deacons in the room, and I'm going to ask the two deacons at the two tables to come forward and the deacons in the back to go to their tables. But if you're a follower of Jesus, he said this table is something that is offered and available to you all the time. Now, as a, just a, a tradition, we have Lord's Supper about once every eight to ten weeks. But when you eat at ML Rose, when you eat at Sonic, wherever you're going after, you're like, anytime you eat, he says, you, you break bread and you drink the cup in remembrance of his body being broken and his blood being shed for you so that in him you can be strong and courageous. So in just a minute, I'm going to pray. 
And if you're a follower of Jesus and you'd like to come to the table, I, I will encourage you to slip out kind of towards the walls and come forward. If you're in the second half of the room, the back, there's two tables back there. Um, and you may just want to pray and say, I just, I just want to thank you for doing for me what I, like I struggle to, to, to put it all together and God, I thank you for your faithfulness to die on my behalf. Maybe you just want to return your thanks. Maybe you want to say, I need strength. I need courage. And this is a reminder that you are with me. And that's what I need, God. Maybe that's what you want to pray. There may be something else you need to do, but I'm, I'm going to just sit up here on a stool and just wait to see if everybody's been served. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, you can be strong and courageous through faith in him by giving your life to follow Jesus. So repent of your sin. Acknowledge your need in him. Confess your desire for him to come into your life. Give your life to Jesus and then come forward to the table and partake of communion as well. But when it looks like everybody's had a chance to be served, so you'll get these elements, you'll take them back to your seat. When it looks like everybody's been served, I'll come up here and lead us to partake together. Here's my only request of you in the next few minutes. You be strong and you be courageous. Not because of me, not because of you, but because Jesus is with you in this moment. Deal? God, work in this room for your glory, for the joy of your people. Help us to be strong and courageous. We thank you that you're with us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.